Good afternoon. My name is John Gearson. Uh, I'm the director of the Centre for Defence Studies and um, also of the Freeman Air and Space Institute, under whose auspices uh, this event is being brought to you today. Um, reflections on the integrated review uh, in conversation with Air Marshal Andrew Turner. Um, uh, and he will be in conversation with uh, my colleague, uh, Lady Moira Andrews. I'd just like to tell everybody that this event is being recorded and will be live streamed. And if you want to ask questions, uh, please use the Q&A function um, and we will uh, get round to some questions um, later in the session, uh, pretty much on any aspect of the integrated review. Um, Air Marshal Andrew Turner is Deputy Commander Capability for the Royal Air Force, responsibility, excuse me, responsible for delivering its strategy through people, equipment, training infrastructure and support so that the RAF can deliver air and space power for the nation and project power and influence around the world. He's a helicopter pilot. I was going to say former, and probably, probably not the case, but anyway, a helicopter pilot and has served in the RAF for 36 years. He's a keen rower and um, he tells me a self-professed optimist. You certainly need it with the integrated review. Um, Lady Moira Andrews is a visiting professor in the Department of War Studies at King's College in London and is a member of the Freeman Air and Space Institute's advisory board, um, as is Air Marshal Turner, as it happens. Lady Andrews was formerly a senior government legal advisor and now runs her own law firm specialising in all aspects of national security. She also sits on a number of company boards as well as government bodies, advisory councils and committees. The format is that uh, Lady Andrews and Marshall Turner will, will have a conversation for about 25 minutes to 30 minutes, and then I'll open it up or I'll pass on questions that have been proposed. So with that, I'll hand over to um, Lady Andrews. Thank you. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, as all of us here know, the, um, the paper Global Britain in a Competitive Age to give the integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy its full title was published on 16th March. It follows several no notable developments since previous reviews, in particular, the UK's departure from the EU, the COVID-19 pandemic and the consequent economic downturn, the rise in the use of hybrid warfare techniques, particularly by Russia and China, and several terrorist attacks. It also follows the merger in September of last year of the FCO with DFID to form the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. The integrated review was followed closely by the publication of the Defence Command paper, in which the government outlined its planned investments in and savings to defence in response to the ambitious set out in the uh, review. So we've now had about you know, some 10 weeks to absorb the review and to um, work out what it means. So in fact, in the, in the Times only this morning, Max Hastings described the integrated review as an admiral statement of where Britain would like to go, bereft of plausible explanations about how it might get there. Um, and last week, there was an excellent King's event um, in which Lord Peter Ricketts was in conversation with Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman to launch his book, Hard Choices. And no, he hasn't paid me to, to plug this. Um, but his take on the IR, uh, which he described as comprehensive but not integrated, was that there were too, too many competing priorities in it and that it failed to choose which headline wants to go with. So I'm going to put my first question to A. Marshall Turner and say, do you think that these criticisms are fair? Um, Elaine Morris, well, thank you very much indeed. I, I think um, we are unbelievably clear about what uh, we need to do next and in what order and sequence. Firstly, the review led on uh, you know, a fairly fundamental shift in how we view and see our place in the world. Secondly, what defence's part in that is both in terms of you know, fundamental security, projecting the sense of the nation and uh, raising and enabling prosperity for us, you know, which I think are three valid and reasonably um, stable goals. And um, thirdly, there was a, a dramatic germ and gene inside the, sorry, gene, not germ, inside the review, which led us to, uh, the, uh, you know, substantial modernization across our equipment portfolio, which ties very closely to the ways of warfare, the integrated operating concept has set out. And, you know, behind all that was a shift towards, um, you know, substantial opportunities from technology. 
So, I mean, I don't think those are undue priorities for us to take forward and they're all discreet and able to be moved forward equally. I think it takes you to a different sort of approach for you know, the Ministry of Defence and, and the Royal Air Force inside that. It takes you to, um, you know, greater presence around the world in different places, perhaps more unusual places than we have been contemporarily relevant and, and um, used to, in particular the, uh, the departure of Queen Elizabeth, uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth last, uh, last weekend was notable in that regard. Not least with, you know, the fifth gen air power on top of it, enabled by space power, you know, the space command forming as it did on the 1st of April, the previous Freeman conversation uh, appertains to that. You know, and then a journey of shifting from essentially analog platforms for us to digital platforms um, across the enterprise. So I think actually, I, I think, you know, we're very clear on what the priorities are and, uh, you know, the sequence will get after them in. So I, I think perhaps, uh, you know, when you, if you zoom out and reflect across government in the round, that might be the case, but it's certainly not the case for us. We're very clear on uh, where the Secretary of State and Defence and COBRA wants us to go. Right, well, in fact, you, you mentioned um, a lot about technology there, and the Defence Secretary stated um, that this review was going to deliver for the armed, armed forces that are fit for tomorrow's battle mm. by switching from traditional warfare to technological war fighting, and that those armed forces would um, rely on um, technology to deliver speed, readiness, and resilience instead of mass and mobilization. So do you think that the review achieves this, or are there still some gaps in the capabilities? Well, I mean, from the Royal Air Force perspective, it definitely has achieved it for us. We, you know, we're moving away from what we have um, had for many years, which is a numbers of aircraft uh, fleets. You know, I think some 40, I joined the Air Force in the 80s and we had some 30 fleets then. So we've, we've grown in a far greater scale in the numbers of types of aircraft we've operated. And in, in, in most cases, actually, the number of, of, of each aircraft and each fleet has, has reduced. So uh, I think you could argue that over time, there are our equipment portfolios become less efficient. So that by reducing them, by focusing on less types and growing the capability of each within that, like Atlas, um, like uh, the new protector, like Lightning and Typhoon, you know, we'll end up with a you know, far more lean organization, but that is more productive, more available, and able to go in and be in more places. So that's the first thing. The second thing I think is that, you know, as we shift to digital platforms, our ability to analyze um, uh, the data that how they're working and operating will allow us to enhance you know the, their availability through better logistical um, interventions more um, optimized stock holdings of spares you know and that actually not um, undoing and unfolding aircraft to try and work out if they're broken or not to so leave them until they tell you that they're broken because they've got digital management systems just like modern cars and, and many modern systems do so I think those things for me tell, tell, tell me that we'll be in a our capacity to do to operate will be greater. Um, I think it's also true that the uh, the nature of the modern battlefield has shifted to, to a sort of new technological leap. So if you go back to Gulf War One in the early 90s and the and the art of precision weapons, which was novel and uh, relatively low in number proportionally, about less than five percent, I think. So now it's almost not possible in a modern battlefield when you take into account the constraints and um, right constraints of should we say collateral damage and legal and ethical sort of implications that you need to be a lot more precise. It's also the case that you don't need quite so much um, firepower to achieve the same effects. And some of the weapons we're thinking about are have temporary, not necessarily destructive uh, outcomes. So this is all another form of technology. Another one is that, you know, as we shift towards greater force generation through synthetic devices, decision-making analysis, uh, supporting in MOD through you know, gaming machine type uh, philosophies. This allows us to be, become a bit more precise with our choices, which is, you know, in the end will become more resilient. And then thereafter, we'll be able to generate the forces in an online way through simulation and synthetics that otherwise we previously would have need great set piece exercises, which, you know, in a modern world is perhaps less efficient. It doesn't mean we'll fly the aircraft less. It just means that when we're flying them, they'll be in sort of difficult places for the prime minister, not flashing around in circles in Lincolnshire which might have been the case in the 70s or so. So it's just, uh, technology will take us to new levels. I think the last point actually um, is that the battlefield itself is highly technologically dependent. So, you know, the timing signals for traffic lights in Reading today and the dialysis machines in Oxford and the financial transaction systems in Edinburgh, you know, critically depend on space, on, on, the, on, the, on the timing signal. 
these things are you know, germane to the battlefield as well. So there are areas and places now where technology is absolutely central to our ability to you know, prosecute armed forces activity, whether that's protecting our interests, engaging our partners, or um, constraining our enemies wherever we might want to. And then ultimately, of course, fighting, as the OPSI says, is something we must be ready for. So there will be a case for mass. Uh, the, I think that will endure. Ground holding land formations will still need to you know, prevail in certain circumstances. But technology, I think, will be a foundational part of everything we do in a way that is a, a, a different, you know, a different level and order of magnitude than, than before. Yeah, so how do you think the um, creation of the National Cyber Force might play into this? Well, cyber is one of our five domains, so land, maritime, air, space and cyber. And I think you can see through the way our adversaries are, are uh, impacting us, whether it's through solar winds or other, other attacks on our system, that you know, these are techniques that can disrupt the normal way of life, both uh, not just the military and security dynamic, but also you know, the way commerce works and the, how populations move around and expect a sort of a, a standard of living and, and amongst other things. So uh, cy cyber, both in the defensive and offensive side, is actually a really important dynamic to be very mindful of. The defensive side is really important to make sure that our systems are resilient to attack, we can repair them fast, and it doesn't disrupt our, our tempo. And offensive cyber has been used by our adversaries routinely to disrupt people in a slightly grey zone sense, um, away from, shall we say, rolling out armour and tanks and warships and jets, but to allow operations to carry on in a, in a slightly more oblique and uh, opaque way. Now, that, those techniques you know, are slightly more difficult to attribute. You know, there isn't a, a badge on the side or the remnants of a shell case, so you can work it all the way back to a sovereign capital for attribution and therefore holding people to account in the United Nations or between capitals in any other way. So it is, it is a slightly more complex form of warfare, but nevertheless, the cyber domain is a crucial, you know, five of five for us, which, um, you know, is going to be part of our thinking in every aspect of defence from here on. You could argue, in fact, let's flick it round slightly, that we have our five domains. It's almost impossible to conceive of a circumstance now where any one domain would operate in and of itself and on, uh, without the support of any other domain, except for cyber. Cyber is the domain which could act independently without implications or impact on the other domains. But it's not possible in my mind to conceive of a, an act uh, in the armed forces space that, that wouldn't be dependent on some other area of, uh, of defense. So you know, the uni domain act is, is dead, I think, from this point forward. Right. So we, we've talked a lot about hard power, um, but in November last year, so in, in November last year, the, um, the government announced, uh, you know, four year surge in defence spending of some 16.5 million. Mm. Um, and, but that announcement came hot on the heels of a significant cut in the overseas aid budget. So this seems to send quite a strong message about the UK as a purveyor of hard power rather than soft power. Although the IR actually talks about um, UK's ambition to be a soft super soft power superpower, in fact, it says I think it's ranked third in the world for that. So, how do you see this being reflected in the size and shape of the armed forces? And do you see the armed forces as being able to take up maybe some of the slack um, in projecting that soft power? Well, not, I can't sort of comment on the, the sense of slack, but certainly I do think that we have a huge amount to offer in the area of soft power. And I think that's one of the you know, great reasons for the carrier strike group's deployment over the next seven to eight months or so that you will be able to see play out, whether that's the convening power of significant armed forces activity arriving in a port or over an airfield or on, on the land in some place uh, to bring about other opportunities for government and the nation. And I, I recall with, um, you know, with, with great reflection on 2016 when we had typhoons going to Japan and the Red Arrows in China, this sort of duality of hard and soft power, you know, uh, allowed all sorts of opportunities to be springboarded from that. I think the Red Arrows tour was quoted by Great, uh, by, um, great Britain, the, the number 10 um, enterprise of having um, catapulted £2 billion pounds worth of inward revenue the UK you know just through whether it's you know the, some of our key corporate partners that we were that we were working closely with or just the wider ability to to close out deals um, you know that were basically brought about by long periods of negotiation but then a significant event like a, a high profile public tour 
So I think the UK Armed Forces increasingly will be being used um, to be present on the world stage in more places than we've been before. As I said earlier, you know, and potentially it's the more unusual locations. I think our equipment, we need to see that increasingly through the lens of the opportunities for uh, a growth in sales, which the Air Force and Air Power has done for years through marketing you know, great British products, but through the lens of the armed forces for, for onward sales. I think that will extend and broaden to not just Type 31 and other platforms like that, but also into the land equipment domain as well, and possibly into space, who knows, as that grows uh, momentum in due course. So I think we'll be used in more, more ways than that. I also think we can use our, the kite mark that is the British Armed Forces to, um, to sort of develop uh, training enterprises that uh, you know, can, can build on sort of land warfare techniques, but into everything from flight line security to port management, freight management, logistics systems, medical services, even HR operations. We have something to offer for other nations uh, in their own development. So I think that's an opportunity where we can use soft power inside the armed forces. And then finally, of course, you know, if these things don't work and we're already downrange in difficult places, learning and knowing the world in a better way, understanding the local population, the, the international relations geometry and some of the, uh, um, some of the social uh, dynamics that will help us um, act more effectively if, if, you know, if we have to move towards constraining an enemy or fighting them. So I think the soft power angle to the armed forces will, will increase because the IOPC, the integrated operating concept, tells us that. Secretary of State and certainly the Prime Minister have strongly indicated in their speeches in Parliament around the use of the armed forces being in, in more places in, uh, and for more reasons and purposes. And I think it remains a responsibility of us as public servants um, to support British business wherever we possibly can. Not a prime task, but nevertheless, it should absolutely be in our minds uh, wherever we are. So, uh, so I think there's opportunity for all in this. And I think, uh, you know, for me, if you're joining the armed forces today, sort of uh, 36 years or so ago, what, a, what an exciting portfolio ahead. You know, I've buy myself a 90 page passport, not a 30 page one, because you probably will need the whole of it in any, any one 10 year span. Uh, well, you, you mentioned um, international relations uh, a minute ago, and um, obviously following the uh, UK's departure from the EU, relationships are you know, perhaps a little fraught in that direction at the moment. Um, but the integrated review nevertheless states that the UK uh, is going to be the single European contributor, the largest, greatest, sorry, the largest single European contributor to the security of the Euro-Atlantic area to 2030. And it also makes mention of um, reinforcing the Lancaster House Treaties, which underpins, uh, underpin the, um, the British-French Defence and Security Corporation. Um, so how do you see that um, squaring with the tilt towards um, Indo-Pacific, which uh, the IR um, majors on? Um, and is it perhaps, in Lord Ricketts' words, a slogan, not a strategy? Well, I mean, the first point is around Europe. And we were, all, of our, all of the European nations are pressured um, unreasonably by Russia on the sea, below the sea, on the sea, so seabed, through cyberspace and in the air. And so this... This persistent friction is, um, you know, unnecessary and unreasonable, and we need to find a way to um, to, to hold Russia to account for these uh, their acts and um, push back. And so, whether it's our partners in Ukraine or in the Baltics or the, the Middle European nations around France and Germany, or those in the periphery around Greece, uh, you know, and in the Mediterranean, these are places where you know we can act and provide valid, valued, and valuable support, and we have done for years. I think with the advent of our of, of a space um, command, uh, with the um, the sailing of the first of two of our aircraft carriers, with the acquisition of Lightning, and with the um, reconfiguring of the land forces domain and the expansion well not expansion but the restatement of our capabilities in the high north, you know are uh, all material to our ability to act with great power and poise across Europe. Um, and let's hope that the balance of power, you know, remains stable and that we, and some of these acts are, are ceased. None of that, though, prevents us from also being um, in, in the Asia-Pacific region. And that's, uh, you know, part of what talk, was talked about through the integrated operating concept and the command paper is this ability to aggregate quickly forces that are widely dispersed for effect in different places. And I think the ability to move quickly, and that would obviously be, um, you know, definitely something that the Air Force is, uh, um, uh, you know, 
it's not an attribute of air power means we can move quickly but also we can move quickly to aggregate land forces or you know quite often activities at sea you know don't um, prevent uh, the ability to move a carrier over great distances or or warships or submarines so i think the natural capacity of our armed forces as a consequence of the review the 16 and a half extra billion pounds will it will help enormously in that over the settlement period and i think it doesn't deny our ability to do to be present uh, in more than one place across the world at any one time so our you know our efforts in the south atlantic in the sub-saharan african in the middle east today across mediterranean europe and at home are all continuing despite uh, you know the various pressures we face the, the advent of the aircraft carrier in this particular tour will take us through singapore and the malacca straits and on into the far east which will help us sort of put, put a reasonably routine presence back in that area you know it's not for the it's not it's not the first warship to go through those waters to japan in the last in the most recent um, few years and it won't be the last so our ability to prosecute those operations will continue and i think through pulsing air operations to singapore to the fbda nations through the basama lima activities our continued engagement with india and uh, and pakistan in the region you know will continue to show a presence in in that area i think it's also probably true that whilst um, you know there are substantial markets there that the government will, will be looking to access through wider national prosperity reasons you know we share the security dynamic in the far east which you know is with our principal five eyes nations australia new zealand canada and us and, and ourselves and so that's something through better closer coordination with them through force flow and sharing assets and using the co uh, coterminous basing of logistics for for us platforms like the f-35 for p-8 poseidon for e7 wedge tail for a400 atlas you know where there are types operated by other nations it should make it much easier for us to pulse around the world without having to carry a sort of freight train of logistics behind us so we'll be able to be a more agile as well and therefore you know a tilt is not just you know a, a, a shift in mass it's actually an ability to be there quickly as well so i think you know both both are feasible and uh, you know they're both very both are very much in our minds okay um I'd like to take you in a different direction now, as it were, because I, I know that you're also a diversity and inclusion champion for the RAF. Yes. And although the IR it's asserts that culture, diversity and inclusion are among its priorities for reform, uh, analysis of the narrative actually in the IR and, and the Defence Command paper show little more than lip service is actually paid to diversity. And unlike the SDSR, which actually had specific targets for women and BAME communities. It makes no reference to women or ethnic minority representation in the armed forces. Do you think that, you know, does that concern you at all? Um, so I can't comment on the reference to it in the paper, but what I can tell you is that it is a, it's a huge piece of work for us inside all the armed forces and the and strategic command right now. We have all signed up to levels of ambition, which are really um, stretching. And we, we've signed up to a moving towards 50% recruiting of uh, women into the, into the Royal Air Force and moving to 30% black, Asian, ethnic minorities into the armed force, into the Royal Air Force. So the, these are figures which are, you know, uh, pressing us. And uh, last year we doubled the number of women that were recruited and tripled the number of black, Asian, ethnic minority people that were recruited. So with the, with the journey is not just a, a, a christening of a start point. We're already in in year three of that uh, of, of mobilization if you like of that policy but you know why is this important i mean what what we've both described there is aspects of visible diversity you know, you know what, what one looks like and but what's really important to me isn't so much what people look like although that's a this is a great way of making a difference in this area what's really important to me is what people think like cognitive diversity a slightly more invisible form of diversity now you can change what that looks and feels like by recruiting a different type of person women and black asian ethnic minorities um, and other ways because we're all cognitively different um, my wife tells me i'm perfectly on the spectrum which i'm very comfortable with but you know as nick hein has declared recently and quite publicly my naval counterpart he he is neurodiverse and uh, i think that's really good that the armed forces are accepting and embracing of people who think differently but what's really important to me is we get uh, this cognitive diversity around social uh, background, around ethnic uh, backgrounds, religious um, and geographic uh, uh, reference points so that we can have a much, more, much more uh, richer workforce. 
which itself will mean that the decisions we made are found on better insights and understandings of the world that we face, which will make our decisions more resilient, will get more challenge, as Chilcott set out for us, that we should be thinking about it more, more vigorously. And that will make our decisions more robust and hopefully make them last longer. So the visible diversity journey that wasn't perhaps referenced as strongly as it has in previous years in the command paper was, is absolutely a huge thing inside our, all of our services. The targets are really stretching, but appropriate. And, uh, but, but the targets are an indirect method of getting to a better place, which is a more thinking service that allows us to be much more challenged and challenging internally, which hopefully will mean that we're you know, more successful on the battlefield and, you know, frankly, and between the services in the boardroom as well. Oh, indeed, yes, I noticed that uh, GCHQ was um, advertising recently specifically um, for dyslexics to join um, GCHQ because they're good at pattern spotting. Um, so I'll ask you probably just one final question. And if you could go back in time and do it all again, would you approach it differently? And if so, how? And um, how are you going to prepare for the, uh, the next defence review? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons out of this last 18 months or so. And I mean, because it's, it, I think well, if you look back over defence over the last five years, it's gone through a series of annual sort of reviews and in one way or another, starting with the Sedwell work um, nearly four years ago now. And so we, we had a, you know, if you like, a really good start point um, because there have been so much analysis done ahead of this integrated review. Uh, whether it's the way government works through the fusion doctrine or whether it's about the balance of prioritization of resource or the way the government scrutinizes its choices, the way it forms its national security implementation groups across in the cabinet, drawing on three star DGs from across um, the security departments. All of that brought some you know, great rigor and intellectual analysis and uh, data to, to the fore. But, but if you know, so your question was, what would you do differently and how would you prepare for five years or four years time? But the answer is to try and find the way in which those things came about through uh, organizational happenstance in a way and make sure that they exist for us in the four years ahead. And I think the, the approach that we'd like to take is use things like Freeman Institute, use things like um, our academic placement programs, use the university short course structures use the sort of should we say the, the the ways in which we can learn more about the world and how it will become um, to be ready through internal mechanisms rather than relying on cross-government structures so we have a conceptual steering board which the freeman institute itself it, uh, contributes into um, we have all of our um, academic placements in the, the mphil course in cambridge the oxford places that we keep and all the other university approaches that's the first thing the second thing is we need to stay really close to technology because i think the evolution of technology over these next five years in particular will outpace most predictions that's been the case for the last 12 years anyway but i think importantly it's going to be moving at the same speed in this bit which means that we will fail to predict what's possible in 2024 2025 even now um so you know those, those are things we need to do differently i think um the other one i'd say is that we need to probably join up with our partner air forces, uh, in particular the Five Eyes, but our other close regional ones like France, you, you mentioned Lancaster Agreement earlier, so that we can develop and learn together. Because there's got to be some benefit in the, the sort of pooling of resources and the catalyzing of uh, outcomes through basically different um, groups of people looking at problems. So, um, you know, I certainly have a strong conversation with all those nations I've mentioned uh, in trying to share ideas and investments and, um, uh, capability developments and be, that, that, that's a really valuable journey that might actually help us um, reduce the investment we need to make to potentially get a greater return I mean one of the things that I think is definitely the case is that uh, I um, believe that most of the things that we want to get out after are already fielded somewhere um, they're likely to be in service perhaps in a different sector of, um, of the nation's workforce and maybe in pharma or FS or manufacturing but quite a lot of things we'd like to do to modernize the armed forces and the royal air force in particular are fielded somewhere so most of the challenge is actually on discovery finding things and mm -hmm. then it's about bringing them into the service um, I, there's very little that i think that will be on the edge of creation uh, you know the dyson hoover moment much more about buying the dyson and, and accelerating its, its employment and use within 
at. And that's not to say I'm endorsing Dyson's Hoover or hair drying products, but you know, the point is that that's an impressive journey of creation, ideation, creation, and into industrialization. I'd rather join that journey at the third step rather than be, at, be in at the beginning. Let others make those difficult decisions, investments or otherwise, fail fast if you like, so that we can capitalize on the things which are proven to work. And I, now I think that, yes, here's John to field some questions. Thanks very much to both of you. Um, and in fact, I, I'm going to abuse my position and uh, throw a question to the two of you myself before I turn to the Q&As. Um, as I think you, some people know uh, who are on this call, we're going to be publishing a series of, of commentaries and articles about the integrated review. And um, one of the things that's come out of the, uh, the drafts that I've been reading is that uh, in terms of industrial uh, defense strategy, uh, and the in integration of the commercial sector and the private sector. Um, the ambitions of the integrated review, um, I, I think I can give this away, are um, uh, celebrated and, and seen as ambitious. Um, but there is a question mark over whether we have the capacity in Britain yet to actually deliver on, the, on, on, on that ambition. Um, and, and, and specifically, wh whether the cultural barriers to that, to that effective working in this, in this, what will be a new environment to some extent, if it, if it goes as planned in the integrated review, can be overcome. Um, I just wonder if you could just perhaps reflect on, on what some of those challenges might be and, and how we would get around them. Thanks. Um, so, I th so it's a very good question. So, I think there are there are challenges associated with our ability to, which is rather con contradictory to my last point around developing. And bringing on new equipments and i think this is an area where we'd like to focus as much on the small and medium enterprises which often are the kernel of good ideas before they get assimilated into bigger bigger programs that's the first thing i think there are different ways of running um, people that we'd like to get after as well which i think is a a, a mo many of the royal air forces of approaches to uh, human relations and are, you know the way we run people were cast in the 1930s and are largely still of a 1970s process so there's a, there's a substantial amount of change uh, feasible there. Much of that is in flight already commissioned. I think that will lead us uh, naturally towards a journey of greater automation. Um, uh, you know, things that should be done by more effectively by machines, more reliably, more predictably, and you know, through a 24 hour period. That, that itself will release the workforce to be reskilled in different areas, which is one of the approaches is to shift our employment structure from branches and trades to, to, to professions that will allow us to skill people for the modern workplace, the modern equipments, the modern forms of warfare in a much more agile way. That also will have the secondary benefit of uh, removing quite a lot of people, several thousand from our training schools, which you know, by definition are not at the front line and therefore the workforce is biased towards uh, you know, the training regime in a way that we, we could perhaps um, optimise it. I think that a third area would be how we support and look after equipment. You know, there are modern ways of uh, logistics support and ma maintenance of, um, of failures, if you like, sort of uh, redundancies on aircraft and systems that we should be able to harness. And there's some great ideas here, not least in the, in the uh, in, you know, airport luggage management is actually a really interesting case in, 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 in uh, to study around the data management and the uh, fluid dynamics of products around a, a place. So, so there's some interesting ideas which come out of that. I think the other point is around infrastructure in our estate. You know, we've got a load of estate, quite a lot of it was cast pre-Second pre War. A lot of it is still fixed in, you know, literally uh, lead pipes and old, old infrastructure facilities which need recapitalizing. So there's uh, quite a lot that's required in that area, but it also needs, we need, just need to be sure that we're um, renewing, refreshing and building on a state that we want to keep for the long term. And at the same time, we need to remain a bit resilient from disruption by our enemies and adversaries on the, the, the number of bases that we retain. Last point would be, uh, I haven't touched on them, but they're a crucial point of our future, which is our, our reserve forces, which we see being grown into a new direction around um, still doing many of the things they're doing today, but growing in the technological skills where we might find it difficult under price points for people's pay, which is a bit alliterative, apologies for that, but the, the amount we pay people uh, to hold them in regular service. And that might be an area where we can actually draw on cyber type people coding and information warriors, perhaps some people from the space industry, where 
you know, I expect all those things will grow in our, uh, in our fielded list of capabilities, but we probably don't want to hold all those skills inside the service on a permanent basis. So there's something around the reserve forces, which is an interesting dynamic. The last one is around industry. You know, uh, we, we're critically dependent on industry for maintenance, support and management of our systems. That's obvious we're a technological service, but we ought to be able to work better with them, a more smooth and integrated way around the workforce. And this relates to sponsored reserves, the ability to flex people in and out of a polo shirt to a DPM shirt, you know, of a day or a month or a week or, or an annual basis. So I think there's, you know, in all, each of those areas, there are great ways which we can think and act and work differently um, with society, with our key partners and, and amongst ourselves. We, do, we, we don't know it all by long margin, but what I do know is that most of the things, as I said to Moira earlier, most things we want to do are being done somewhere. And it's actually accessing in it, that insight so we can move quickly and adopt practices that have been proven to work elsewhere. Um, that's, that's the key for me. And some of this is in the whole force concept, which uh, we've written about before. Moira, you'd like to come in? Um, I was going to say that, um, Britain's exit from the EU actually does free us up um, to be more flexible about procurement. So we're not, we're no longer bound mm. by the EU rules on, on government procurement. Um, but one of the big challenges is that, um, I mean, obviously you, you get defence company giants, but 90% of the, um, the, the sort of the security sector is made up of SMEs. And um, but you know, government has a real challenge. Try it cannot maintain you know relationships with the thousands of SMEs that are out there. So actually, I know that you know, industry is in dialogue at the moment with um, government to see you know what sort of um, procurement model we could come up with that is more fleet of foot and sort of irons out some of these wrinkles because I do think that that's quite a big challenge because there's there's a huge amount of um, sort of um, pent up um, innovation that is in the SME sector. Yeah I think I think that's one of the big challenges isn't it about having that dialogue uh, beyond the, 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 the normal for uh, in moving this forward. Yeah. Lots of questions coming in so uh, whilst I'd like to uh, carry on with this I, I, I will move on. Um, uh, Isolator asks um, how will the UK balance affordability with the desire for so many F-35 aircraft? Yes yeah, so it's, it's a good question. Sorry, go on, <laughs> Moira. No, I'll, I'll um, leave that one to you, F-35, not my stop. Okay. <laughs> so we, we've got a, a, a really good plan of um, a plan for our combat air force. Firstly, we're shifting quite a lot of it towards um, uncrewed aircraft to the acquisition of our swarming drone squadron, um, the loyal wingman uh, uh, additive capability, which uh, Spirit Aerosystems is developing a demonstrator for. So that will be fielded and flying inside this parliament um, and uh, obviously we're moving into protector which you'll see a version of in uk later th later this year from general general atomics a bigger force than we've got for reaper able to do more fly higher longer and carry more so that's the first point the second point is that in a, in the crude combat air, air force we are planning for tempest the, the fcas the future combat air system crude fighter element to take over from lightning sorry from typhoon in the mid 30s into the early 40s time frame so there were two, there was two billion pounds worth of money in technological development, money put into that, that uh, in the settlement period. So that's a really exciting step forward that should see us li literally close in with a you know, flight demonstration in and around the end of this parliament. Uh, the second point is that we grow, the growth beyond 48 Lightnings is, uh, is planned. We know roughly how many we need to keep the, the carriers afloat with an air wing until 2068, but at the out of service date of uh, the Queen Elizabeth class so that's quite a long way away 47 more years of lightning so you'll you know you'll expect us to be growing that over time and then I think we'll get to a point probably in SDSR 25 if that's when the next one occurs but around that time frame where we'll have to make a judgment over you know the future longer term balance of lightning acquisition so we're committed to 138 uh, we have significant work share based on that and uh, we're in negotiations with Lockheed Martin and the US Air Force and the DOD as to you know what that future buy looks like. So there's much more to come. What we know is we don't need those planes now. So we need to be thinking we'll be acquiring them in the 30s, not the 20s. And therefore we could take a bit of time uh, before we make that judgment. All right. Um, 
I've got a couple more uh, procurement questions and then I'd like to come back to a question for both of you. So if I just uh, uh, summarize a, a couple of them. Uh, Tim Robertson asks uh, provocatively, is the integrated review already dead on arrival? Its ambition to buy British kit if possible seems to be in trouble with the new block two Chinook procurement. Rumored choice of US uh, Jag M over Brimstone for the Army Air Corps AH-64Es. Um, and then uh, on iStar, Mo Abdallah asks, uh, iStar capability requirements were carefully scrutinized. Well, actually, no, I'll come back to that, actually. Um, yeah, an anonymous attendee says, uh, why did we see so much less capability detail regarding platform numbers this year than in 2015? So perhaps if you answer those two, I'll come back to the iStar one in a minute. Yeah, okay. Tim, really good to hear from you. A long time since we've spoken. But the, um, the first point is, I think there's a load of things that we are buying which are very British. And you can look at the Future Armoured Programme for the Land Forces, our own acquisition of um, Atlas or Lightning. Lightning, you know, 20% manufactured across the UK. Lots of return on that. And we get, I think, the total, the total inward revenue for UK Combat Air Acquisition Programme is 40.6 billion. So that, you know, we're, we're, we're earning money on the back of the, uh, the sales of UK manufactured components. That's a really big deal for us. Um, there, there are future opportunities. I think with something like Chinook, there is just um, very little choice actually globally, and there's no European or UK based product that can, that can do what Chinook can do. So, uh, so with, you know, in some of the capability areas, we are um, rather fixed until uh, industry develops a, a competitive competitive program. I can't comment on, unfortunately, on the Jaguar position on on uh, on Apache. But what I can say is that the spear cap family of weapons coming through MBDA, uh, you know, are world leading. And as we saw, you know, with uh, Brimstone in the first instance, there are things that the other nations simply don't have: the precision, the weight, um, and the utility of different launch points. Spear cap three, in particular, some of the things that we're doing with that weapon. You know, will be world. Uh, you know, is world leading now. But it, once it gets into production, manufacture, we'll be in a very, very different place. And I, I would also cite Meteor as a uh, comparison against Amram. So there are lots of UK products, Stevenage and other places besides, all over the country where there's inward, uh, inward revenue opportunity. And I think if you're looking into the land domain, there's an early and emerging opportunity with the Puma replacement um, to focus on, you know, British acquisition, whether it's British IP or, or jobs, whatever way, there, there are choices there for the department to consider. Uh, John, what was the second question that was about? Uh, um, sorry, you lost the ball on the second question. Uh, sorry, get to my um, uh, catching up with my questions on the. Uh, oh, it's about, it's about platform numbers. Being oh, platform numbers, yes. Okay. Details. Yeah, so, so the platform numbers are already a matter of record, whether it's 138 Typhoon uh, Lightning or whether it's uh, 22 Atlas or our 14 Voyager. You know, these are numbers already in the public domain. So they weren't laboured in the documentation because there are other things to talk about. There are other choices ahead, though, I have to say, you know, as we as, as the IOPSI and the command plan begins to develop in time, you know, we'll see different investment choices that are probably possible towards the end of the decade, uplifts in different types. I think the key for me is we, we're, we're reducing the number of fleets and increasing the number of aircraft in each one. That capital investment in the disaggregated fleets, you know, in synthetics and logistics, in command leadership and management, industrial relations, spares, is really, really hurts us. And therefore, we need to reduce the number of types we're looking after uh, and grow their individual utility. That's the key to modernizing the front line. Thank you. Um, John Bodie from Canada asks, uh, recognizing the advancement of cyber warfare, uh, uh, warfare and attacks, do you have a view on whether international humanitarian law is keeping pace with these advancements, paying particular attention to the principles of distinction and proportionality? And I think this is something perhaps for both of you to uh, have a go. don't know who wants to go first. Oh, well, I was, going to, say, <laughs> I was going to say, yes, I thought I might be um, being good for that one. I mean, law never keeps up with um, developments. I mean, it's, it just um, cannot develop as fast as, um, you know, as, as technology can develop and as events unfold. Um, but actually, I was going to pick up, in fact, on um, something that Andy mentioned earlier, which, which is the, you know, the increasing um, move to development of unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, because, you know, I, I don't think we're, we're, I can't envisage 
um, as ever being in a position where we are going to be you know, engaging in any operations as a, as a single unit, sorry, you know, as the UK. We, I'm sure we will all, always be doing it alongside allies. So that actually brings a sort of, um, you know, yet another dimension in that not only do we need to sort of agree on how on, on what the law is, but also on how we interpret it. Because I think past experience has shown that it's not that we don't all play by the same rules, it's that we just don't actually um, interpret the same rules in the same way. And so that makes for a lot of complication, particularly when one is um, engaged in operations alongside allies. So that, yeah, that's my, my take on it. I think the only thing I'd add to that, actually, Moira, is the, the principles of use of armed forces about about discrimination, proportionality, military effect. You know, those 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 principles that we apply to um, using the armed forces uh, will will continue to apply. I think the point that the question is leading to, though, is that is the um, is the ability to detect and predict the consequences in the cyber domain of fiddling with somebody else's ones and noughts. That is obviously less straightforward than it is of blowing up a small building in a remote piece of, piece of uh, terrain somewhere. Um, but, but, our, the, the, but the principle will still apply. And this is the, tar the ethics around targeting do not change with the advent of the cyber domain. Um, so it just makes it more hard, more, more difficult, which means that we will need increasing experts around cyber and coding in particular to understand the second, third, fourth order consequences of a cyber attack in some way or other, both inward and external. Thank you. Um, Tony Osborne asks, um, how many or, uh, of the integrated review changes to the RAF are dependent on pro positive outcomes from Project Astra? And the supplementary, what are the next steps in Project Astra? So uh, in a funny way, um, the IR is Astra and uh, Astra is the IR. And the reason I say that is that we christened or sort of the gestation of Astra was back in May 19. Um, it was written out in a directive by the chief in December 19. And we've been rolling it out since as broadly three things, sort of big rocks, programs, big things we wanted to do from the top, which I'm broadly responsible for, a network of ambassadors who are agitating from the bottom on stations and units with the ability to horizontally share good ideas. And, um, you know, a substantial uh, network of sort of communication and enablement by the front line by my counterpart. So in a, in, a, in a way that everything that we set out to get after in Astra, we then We seem to have a freeze at the moment. Um, I'm going to turn up. We'll just hold on a second. See if he returns to us. CTX and the dimension of space. Those are the four things we went after, and the IR has returned all four. Um, the enabling things around um, uh, people policies, around weapons, uh, are all in there as well, which are things that we've been hunting for and uh, aim to do. The reason why I hope this will be successful, I say I hope, I mean, there's no reason why it shouldn't be, is that the IR outcomes are now expressed in Parliament, they're in, on record in Hansard. Secondly, they are sewn into our bottom lines. No, I think he's... Um... Andrew, we've, we've lost you again, I'm afraid. Um, your picture's frozen, but we also heard you for a while, but now we've lost... Delivery against the top of the Andrew, I'm afraid we, we've lost your audio and your picture's frozen. I don't know if you're... Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So, or, or have you lost... We lost you or your voice as well several times, but so okay. Apologies for that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So I was just saying that the, um, the we've sown many of the IR outcomes, which were Astra in nature at the origin, into our command plan, into personal objectives, and into the financial structure. So there's a um, you know there's a. Andrew, we've lost you again, I'm afraid. Can you hear me still? John, I think you're on mute now. 
Yes, we, we actually lost you again, Andrew, and, and your 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 screen is still frozen. I'm afraid. Okay, no. but can you get, can you hear me? Okay. No, you okay. keep breaking up. I'm afraid. Um, okay. So we heard half the answer, I think. Okay. Um, let, let's let's try another question, and then we'll see where, how how we do. Um, okay. Mo Abdallah asks um, or refers to iStar capabilities being carefully scrutinised in 2015 uh, as requiring 20 protectors, five. Um, AEW uh, systems to replace the E3s, um, and now you're committing to 16 protectors, three E7s, and and the F the F35s. Uh, is this? Are you content that you have the equipment needed despite the re reduction in numbers? And he adds, um, the independence CEO of the UK seems odd given the dependence on Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and General Atomics in this area. Yeah, so we are confident and we're confident because these equipments have got, um, since we initially looked into them, have got more capability than we originally thought, whether it's protectors ability to, um, to carry different systems and operate in different domains or wedge tail E7's ability to contribute in different ways to the ISR um, fleet. And at the same time, FCAS, uh, the, 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 the tier one swarming drone, the law wingman, drones, they, these can contribute to the ISR network as well. And in the meantime, we're also expanding into the low Earth orbit space uh, geometry with new Earth observation satellite constellations. So I think you know, what we've seen is a, is a, a, chi a sh slight shift in the numbers, but a, an expansion in the types of platforms that are contributing into this, uh, into this ISR domain. Did you get any of that? Yes, we got it all, thanks. Yeah. Ooh, awesome. um, so uh, Matt Withnell asks, what are the opportunities that sustainability in defence presents, both for the department and broader UK interests? Perhaps you can both uh, get a stab at this, but uh, I'll give it to Andy first. Okay, so I mean, this is a big area for us. Um, we uh, have been surprised, but you know, it's, it's only right that how much the youth, youth in our service are really excited by the net zero agenda. So we have, uh, the chief has recently issued a strategy that will see us get to net zero uh, quicker than government wishes through a combination of um, methods of, of generating power on our estate uh, through the normal things that you'd expect us to get out of, which are single-use plastics and use more electric vehicles, those sorts of things. A movement to synthetic fuels for our aircraft and uh, a, a movement away from flying aeroplanes for training purposes and into synthetics, which I touched on earlier. All of these uh, programs have uh, seek to access existing capabilities that are already in place around the world and all of them are proven. So uh, the question we're now facing internally is, uh, is given the recent allocation of our budgets to us from the centre, um, which was towards the middle of, of this month, now we're just judging the balance of our, uh, of our investment to work out how fast we want to move on this particular policy agenda. So I think, you know, there's huge amounts of opportunity and we want to contribute the greatest possible part we can on getting to net zero as early as we possibly can. Thank you. Um, I mean, uh, Sophie Antrobus, uh, my colleague, asks, um, uh, what do you see as the RF role in selling AI and autonomy to what she describes as a suspicious public, even of commercial drones. And she refers to a survey last year, uh, two years ago, which found that less than a third of the British population were positive about civilian drones. Yeah, so it's a good one, isn't it? I think, um, I think I, to a certain extent, the, the, the British public is probably not fully aware of what's going on. Oh. I'm afraid we've lost Air Marshal. Turner right now. Um, I'm just trying to think if I want to push a question to actually I was he's, he's reconnecting um, Moira. Um, Sophie Lane asks uh, considering supporters of Brexit pushed investing in the future of the Commonwealth as a reason to leave the EU why do you think there was little reference to the Commonwealth in the integrated review? Uh, perhaps you might want to take a stab at that. I mean I, I, I think a lot of course a lot of the Commonwealth is encompassed in the Indo-Pacific region, which is the big focus of it, but I think I, I get what, what she means. Um, yes, I mean, I suspect actually it's, it's just that, you know, um, it was focusing on other things and sort of bigger, bigger picture, not that the Commonwealth, you know, isn't part of the bigger picture, but it was really just coming at it from, from a different angle. And I, I suspect that I 
wouldn't have expected to necessarily see specific reference to the Commonwealth um, in that. But I just wondered actually, if uh, not backing that question, if I could come back to the, uh, the question that you just put to Andy about um, the um, you know, unmanned aerial vehicles again. Um, and it's really interesting that uh, there seems to be quite a lot of scepticism about UAVs and the use of drones um, and that sort of thing. Yet, you know, since, since the invention of the longbow, warfare has become more and more detached and, and more remote. Um, and so it is, it's, not, it's not really uh, you know, logical that the, um, you know, we, get, we seem to be skeptical and, and st seem to have this sort of thing, feeling that uh, you know, it's just not cricket to use drones, whereas you know, um, other methods of remote warfare seem perfectly acceptable. Yes. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Marshall Ten is going to be able to join us again. Um, I'm just I'm just hoping that he uh, he's able to to connect. Although we've only got time for probably one more um, question, and I'm just trying to think what I can uh, hit uh, Moira with, uh, which, which yes, is I'm, I'm, I'm two, able to uh, answer questions uh, on the details of yes, the RFE in in, in, yeah. in, uh, in in how we're how we're moving forward. I think he's back now. Can you hear me, um, Andrew? Are you, I can see you're re reconnected. Ah, hello. Good, you're back. Can you can you hear me, Andrew? Hi, John. I might hello. be back. Hello. Sure. Well done. Yep. Um, Moira was just uh, taking us through uh, why the Commonwealth isn't mentioned a lot in the IR. Uh, I think we've got time for maybe one, uh, one, maybe two questions. Uh, to go. Um, a quick one from David Jordan, which you can answer nice and quickly. How important is Tempest to the future vision for air power in the UK? Vital. Full stop. Okay. <laughs> um, Jamie Gray asks, with the reduction in the numbers of aircraft across the board, tranche one typhoons, transport, small acquisition of E7s, is there a worry that we don't have the capability to uh, carry out interventions such as Libya or even Afghanistan anymore? No, because the, the scale of our frontline capabilities are, are not changing. And as a, as I'm not sure if you lost me when I was talking about um, the expansion of our ISR footprint being not just about, you know, E7, about being LEO satellite surveillance and other things besides. So, uh, you know, we're not reducing from seven typhoon squadrons. We're, you know, we're driving up to three uh, lightning squadrons exactly as per the plan. The width of our surveillance capability, no change. Um, the, our, the, you know, the, the movement to Atlas, which is double the size of C-130, uh, you know, that's growing up the, the task line availability scale. So, no, I don't think there's a reduction in our ability to prosecute operations. I think we just do it differently with more precise weapons, more sophistication, and across all five domains, not just in one. All right. With two minutes left, two really tough questions. Uh, number one, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, you said you wanted to avoid, avoid uh, fail-fast culture. But doesn't this have the risk of stifling innovation, a key strategic cornerstone for the future RAF? You've got one minute on that, and then there's a, a nice easy one on Scotland. Okay, so I didn't say fail. I didn't say I want to avoid fail fast. I wanted other companies to do it for us uh, in the sort of ideation creation journey. That, um, but we have got an organisation, the Rapid Capabilities Office, based at Farnborough in Cody Park, whose job it is to fail fast. So we want that innovation culture to be at the, uh, seeded across the organization. That's why we have 1300 Astra ambassadors to try new things on our air bases, wherever they are. Uh, what we need to do is be, you know, as an organization, more comfortable with failing. And that is not in our DNA because we're an institution of last resort and the, the Royal Air Force, like the Army and Navy and the Strategic Command can't fail. But that's not the same as having a go uh, at anything, whether it's playing rugby, or trying a piece of software. We must, we must have that culture in at the bottom and in at the beginning. All right, and the last question is a nice easy one from Tom Burridge uh, on the question of Scottish, possible Scottish independence and how it might impact on the IR's goals. Uh, would resource invested in creating a workable solution for Clyde, Mossy Mouth, distract from the IR goals? Has any thought been given to this? No, because uh, it's well beyond my purview to comment on Scottish independence. So we're very comfortable with the footprint in Scotland that we have. We've, we're investing and deepening in it. 
and it will be vital to the UK national interests and national security as a consequence. The Lossy Mouth is absolutely crucial to the UK's sovereignty and security. Great, thank you very much. Well done. Two difficult questions in, in under, under a minute, a uh, minute and a half. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, Lady Andrews for uh, uh, having a conversation with Air Marshal Turner and, and coping with my throwing her some, uh, what are they called, googlies uh, during the interruption. Uh, and of course, uh, Air Marshal Turner, thank you very much for being so game to answer questions on a, on a wide range of, of topics, actually, uh, taking us beyond just uh, well, not just, but beyond air power and, and, and space policy, uh, and giving us some, some, some really interesting thought, things to think about for the, for the future. Um, I, I will return to some of these on what we hope will be our launch event for our series of commentaries, probably on the 24th of June, a uh, date to be confirmed in the next few days, um, when we can continue this conversation. But thank you both very, very much indeed um, for an excellent conversation. Thank you. And thanks indeed. to thank all you very much the questioners for their really, really penetrating questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you also. Bye-bye. Thank you.